Welcome to the launch of We Don't Have Time and our first climate conference. My name is Ingmar Renzog and I'm the founder of the organization We Don't Have Time. I founded this organization in November of 2016. The development in the world politics made me realize that there will be no political, no country or world leader that will step forward and solve the climate crisis for the rest of us. We must all, as citizens on Earth, step up and come together. We must all, as citizens on Earth, step up and come together. And I believe that the fastest, most efficient and maybe the only way to do this is by modern technology and communication. Our goal is therefore to build the world's largest social media platform focused on climate change so that our members, you, me, my friends, your friends, our families, so that all and everyone can be the change by the power of many. We have to reach an awareness tipping point before we reach the climate tipping point. Because we don't have time to wait. We need to act now to fight the climate crisis. And today, I'm proud to welcome you to the world's first No Fly Public Climate Conference. As our guest, you will be taking part in an absolutely unique combination of world authorities, influencers, authors and celebrity speakers from all around the world, who will give you a never heard combination of facts, insights and knowledge. Our first segment will be about reality, and it starts now. Thank you, Ingmar. Well spoken and a warm welcome to all of you also from us. My name is Julia Messelt. And my name is Martin Hedberg. And this is the 2018 We Don't Have Time Climate Conference. We have four hours of broadcast ahead of us packed with interviews, keynotes and panel sessions about the greatest challenge humanity has ever faced. Of course, I'm talking about climate change. Mm. And this is the first public no-fly climate conference of its kind. No participant travels by plane to attend to the conference. Instead, they call in on Zoom or have traveled to our studio in Stockholm by other means of transportation. And to minimize the climate impact of the, this event, our partner Trine will offset all the carbon footprint of the studio production and the broadcast by investing in off-grid solar energy in Africa. I took my bike here, by the way. Yeah, we are so broadcasting uh, live on uh, YouTube Live, Facebook Live, and also Twitter Periscope, and also via our uh, partner, Business Insider Nordic, starting now until about 7 p.m. Central European time. The whole broadcast will also be uh, available for streaming after the event. Mm. And this conference is divided into three different segments. And the first is called Reality, and it focuses on the state of the climate today. And we will discuss the latest climate statistics, facts, and consequences of global warming. Yeah, we then move on to solutions uh, where we take a closer look at how policy change and technological innovation can help us solve the climate crisis. Mm. And our third and last segment is called action. And here we ask, how do we build a global movement that involves everyone in this fight against climate change? Reality, solution, action. This is what you can expect from us in this broadcast. And we expect that you get involved as well. Use the hashtag. We don't have time to post comments, praise, criticism, whatever. Above all, questions to our speakers and panelists. And your tweet will actually show on this map. Uh, but in order to be shown there, you have to uh, make sure that your, your location is set in your Twitter bio. So... 
again, make sure you have told your Twitter app where you are. Okay, start tweeting, hashtag we don't have time. Uh, Martin, this segment is called The Reality. Right. Is this uh, when I'm about to know how the, earl, uh, how the world will end? Mm, hopefully <laughs> not. <laughs> we, we call this segment The Reality. Ring the alarm bells loud and clear. And let's say we will learn why we need to wake up before it is too late. And I will actually start uh, with a, a segment with a talk on the latest statistics about climate change and a little bit of historical perspective on everything and highlight the severity of this issue. But first, let me introduce our panel. And And joining us from the US is Pam Pearson, founder and executive director of the International Cryosphere Climate Initiative. Um, Professor Dennis Meadows, joining us from the US, known for the limits to growth. And joining us from Tarfala Research Station, far up north in Sweden, is Andreas Bergström. Welcome to you too. And from India, Ruchal Pukan, CEO at Walk for Water. And from Hawaii in the United States, Scott uh, Stuart Scott, founder and executive director of United Planet for Faith and Science Initiative. A very warm welcome to you as well. And Peter Wardhams, professor of ocean physics, University of Cambridge. Welcome, Peter. Yes, of course, we are very happy to have all of you here. But I know that you, Martin, will mm -hmm. start uh, this section with the keynote of your own, is that right? Yeah, that's, yeah. Right. that's right. And are you going to talk about the end of the world? Uh, well, as I said, we're not really there yet, but uh, let's. Um, I want to talk about the, the crisis for the climate and what it will mean in the future. Now, I'm also going to give a little bit of perspective what has happened before and what brought us here. And Let's uh, switch places and the, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so um, welcome and I'll talk about, uh, and I'll start with the glaciers. And of course that is uh, very important in this situation. And I'll start with the glaciers that we had some 25,000 years ago, for, because 25,000 years ago, there was an ice age. And at that time, Sweden was up here, actually on the same place, but two kilometers of frozen water above us. And so climate has always changed. And if you want to know something about how climate is changing and what could maybe could happen in the future, you can look at the prehistoric records. And one of those sites where you can find out about prehistoric uh, information about climate change is from Antarctica at Vostok. And there we have a temperature record stretching back some 400,000 years back in time. And you can see here on the graph moving forward that during times of about 100,000 years, then we have ice ages, and they are interrupted by a short period of warmer periods. And here we are some 25,000 years ago when we had the last ice age. And right now, for the last 11,007, approximately 100 years, uh, we are living in the Holocene, which is our reference point. And everything we have around us, all uh, memories from agriculture, from, from societies and from civilization, has happened here. Humanity has been around for a couple of hundred thousand years, but all our hi historic record is over here. Now, last time we had this uh, ice age, the global temperature was four degrees lower than it is today. Four degrees doesn't sound that much, but that means an ice age. And during that time, sea level was 120 meters below today's sea level. And last time it was as warm as it is approximately right now, was during the last interglacial period, some 130,000 years ago. And at that time, sea level was between six and nine meters above today level. So, right, <coughs> we're moving and we're trying to stretch and stay below two degrees. That is the goal set in Paris. And you can see here, the Paris Agreement goal is actually half an ice age, but in the opposite direction. And you should know also that business as usual means about four degrees warmer within a couple of centuries, which is approximately one ice age in the opposite direction. So this is really, really huge. And I need to stress this, that the Paris Agreement is not a walk in the park. It is half an ice age in the other direction. So we have this goal, two degrees. So stay below two degrees with the aim of 1.5, uh, which is actually half an ice age in the opposite direction. But if we took another perspective and looked at the sea level instead and said, let's limit the sea level rise to two meters. now. It's going to be above five meters. That is something that his prehistoric record could tell us. But that puts some kind of, of perspective into what we're looking into. Now, it's going to take a couple of hundred years before we reach 
multimeter sea level rise, but anyhow, we're heading in that direction, and it's actually today that we decide about that kind of future. All right, what is the climate system, you might ask? Well, the climate system consists of, of many different spheres. We have, of course, the atmosphere, we have the hydrosphere, all the water on this planet, we have the cryosphere, snow and ice, and we'll talk more about the la that later on, and we have the geosphere, land where they are located, and then we have the biosphere, extremely important part of this climate system. And the climate system in itself, it is dynamic, continuously changing, it has positive and need negative feedback loops, changing the system constantly. It is non-linear, so there can be interruptions, and it is irreversible. It always moves forward. And humanity, for the last about 10,000 years, we have been influencing all these different spheres. And for a couple of decades ago, we mentioned the anthroposphere, mankind. We are affecting this planet so much so that we're talking about the anthropocene. And that, that, that phrase was actually coined by Paul Crutzen, and it has to do with the exponential growth of many of the systems that we see around us. So Paul Crutzen, he got the Nobel Prize in 95. He um, coined this uh, phrase, the Anthropocene, 2002. And then he said, we live today in what may appropriately be called the Anthropocene. It's a new geologic epoch in which humanity has emerged as a globally significant and potentially intelligent force capable of reshaping the face of the, Earth, of the planet. And I like this especially. You see, potentially intelligent. We're smart, obviously, but intelligent, well, let's see. Um, Gunderson and Holling, they wrote a couple of years ago, uncertainty in nature is presumed to be replaced by certainty of human control. Social systems initially flourish from this ecological stabilization and resulting in economic opportunity, but that success creates its own failure. So we need to take care of the environment around us and not only look at, at the stabilization situations, because that might end not so good, let's say that. And climate, climate historical uh, perspective, it actually started some 200 years ago. Joseph Fourier, 1824, he discovered uh, global warming. He, he, dis he described what was meant uh, later on uh, called the greenhouse effect. And actually Svante Arrhenius, a Swedish scientist, 1896, he told us that we are actually warming this planet by emitting greenhouse gases. And these two guys, Suss and Rivell, they said 1957, they told us that thus human beings are now carrying out a large-scale geophysical experiment of a kind that could not have happened in the past nor be reproduced in the future. Within a few centuries, we are returning to the atmosphere and oceans, the concentrated organic carbon stored in sedimentary rocks over hundreds of millions of years. So, some updates on the climate. Sea level rise will be worse than previously thought. West Antarctica's ice sheet is not as stable, stable as previously thought, and this is from the last, latest IPCC report, and the next one will be one and a half year ahead. So things are happening really fast in the climate system. Extreme weather is linked to climate change, and it's already here. We can see it. We still don't know how close we are to tipping elements, real big changes in the climate system, the monsoon, the, the Gulf Stream, etc. Global warming of 1.5 degrees is probably already locked in, so we try to keep us close to 1.5 and stay below 2 degrees. We have already lost entire ecosystems, for example, large parts of coral reefs. And ocean acidification is also part of this uh, emission of the carbon dioxide, and the warming of the oceans will continue for centuries, affecting the entire marine systems. We have to face these things. And in order to mitigate climate change, we can only emit a certain amount of carbon dioxide. And that means a lot of the known fossil research needs to stay in the ground. And last but not least, the first IPCC report, it was published in 1990, and since then the emissions has gone up by about 60%. So, Seen from that perspective, we have chosen to fail. Now, we need some, a bit bigger and better story. And for instance, like the one Kennedy told in 1961, when he said, let's put a man on the moon and bring him back safely within a century. Some kind of story like that, but actually a little bit bigger. And we're not heading for the moon. We need to turn around and look for the planet, because this is what we need to take care of in the future. Thank you. Thank you. A bit uh, depressing, I think, but also very interesting. I hope so. It was. Thank you. Uh, we're getting started. You are. You were our first speaker, um, and now uh, we're moving forward. Uh,
Just, I, I, I was thinking climate change is more than melting glaciers. It is, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. More. But you know what our next topic will be. About melting glaciers, it's about for melting. instance. It's about melting glaciers. What a coincidence. We are glad to be joined by Andreas Bergström, who is doing research on the glaciers around Tarfala Research Station in beautiful Swedish Lapland, north of the Arctic Circle. A warm welcome to you, Andreas. It seems like the internet connection, we have some kind of problem. Are we... He might be out on the, on the glaciers, <laughs> do you think so? Mm, a connection to Tarf. <laughs> doing is his, he is. He's doing, he's the, doing research. the research work, so we're having trouble to reach him. So let's try to get a hold of our next speaker, who is Pam Pearson. Is Pam Pearson with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me all right? We can oh, yes, hear we can. you. Let us introduce you. And our next keynote speaker is a former U.S. diplomat who in 2006 resigned in protest over changes to U.S. Development, development policies. She has founded the International Cryosphere Climate Initiative. Pam Pearson will talk about, the how, uh, talk about how alarming the situation is. A warm welcome, Pam. And since we know that you speak some Swedish, we have to say welcome. How are you doing? Yeah, thank you very much. I'm wondering if I should cede to Andreas. He was with us briefly in case he has a difficult connection. No, I, or I, shall let's, I go let's ahead? Stay, now go ahead. Go ahead. Let's, okay. uh, let's, let's stay with you. That's, that's go great. Ahead. So, that's great. Pam, uh, okay. the stage is yours. Right now, Pam. So I am sharing my expected. screen right now. That's great. And are you able to see the slideshow properly? We, we, we can are. see it. Thank you. Okay. Go Excellent. Ahead. And I really appreciated that introduction by Martin because the um, if there are two words I would ask people to take away from uh, today, they would be cryosphere and thresholds. Uh, cryosphere, Martin already defined for you, it means uh, ice and globe. And we really have uh, a climate system that in many ways is determined by the amount of ice we have on the globe. And one could say that the battle against climate change really is the struggle to keep the cryosphere in some sort of a sustainable state. Um, our world's climate really is uh, dominated by ice. And three main messages that are very important as we think about this. First, that cryosphere thresholds aren't determined by an ultimate temperature. They're determined by the peak temperature and by how long we stay at that peak temperature. Um, it's irrelevant how you come back because in order to restore ice, you need to go below freezing one more time. In other words, some of the things that are lost uh, will not return unless we, for some reason, would induce a new ice age. The ice that's in the world right now, much of it was formed during our last ice age. Um, second is that it focused on 2100, which is what our negotiators are focusing on, really misleads and minimizes the cryosphere response. One needs to go over centuries to see that full and inevitable response. Uh, one example that Martin raised in terms of sea level rise, based on today's temperatures, we are going to hit two meters of sea level rise, no matter what. It will take a few centuries to reach, but two meters is now inevitable. So the question before us is how much more than two meters are we willing to live with? And that will be determined by how high the temperature goes in the coming decades. And the third is that our current climate commitments will already cause many thresholds to be crossed, um, especially if an overshoot persists for decades or centuries. But I would also say that there's a growing scientific consensus that even sustained 1.5 degrees is very high risk. And this slide shows you a little bit why, because when we're talking about two degrees of global mean temperatures, in the Arctic, and uh, this is sort of where we are today on the left, um, globally, a two degree mean temperature, as you see, 
uh, if we manage to reach that, is still about five degrees in the Arctic. Um, the annual mean in the Arctic then is one thing, but the winter mean is another. And here again, you're crossing a threshold of freezing water versus non-freezing water. So in the um, Arctic, if we are at, say, a mean seven degrees during uh, the normal part of the year, that still means 13 degrees above. And we're already seeing peak temperatures like that. There was a period where the Arctic was about 12 degrees over its normal mean just this past uh, February. And when that happens, things melt. And you can't freeze them necessarily, again, if you get runoff into the oceans and um, so on. So it is very, very important to pay attention to these irreversible cryosphere feedbacks. The first is permafrost thaw, and I'll run through these very quickly in the limited time we have. The second are the great ice sheets, um, the West Antarctic ice sheets, parts of Greenland. They hold at least 8 to 25 meters of sea level rise. We're not involving East Antarctica at the moment, but that could very easily get involved. And then you're talking about a total of 60 to 70 meters of sea level rise. Um, mountain glaciers are extremely important. We're already at temperatures where we will probably lose most of those. Uh, we can't forget about acidification and eutrophication. Eutrophication is the low oxygen content of water and also Arctic sea ice, which is more reversible. Um, summer sea ice will return in the Arctic at around 1.0 to 1.5 degrees. We still have summer sea ice right now, although it's decreasing, but that involves very, very important feedback, such as some of the extreme weather events, for example, that have been seen in both North America and in Europe during this past winter. Uh, so this is a graphic representation of these cryosphere thresholds and when they start working. So permafrost thaw, for example, is happening today. And one of the key things about this graphic, which we produced for Paris, is that you'll see at the bottom left that it says that today's temperature is 0 0.8 degrees higher than pre-industrial. We're already at 1.1 degrees, and that's less than three years later. Things are happening extremely quickly, and there is quite a lot of speculation as to whether we're going to breach 1.5 degrees already by 2030 in about 12 years. Um, going through some of these irreversible uh, dynamics then, uh, again, very quickly, this is the future of the glaciers. And the purple and blue lines at the bottom show what will happen if we manage to constrain warming either to today or a little bit more than that. The red line is business as usual. And you'll notice that both of these go down to zero as we move ahead in the centuries. But there's a big difference between the blue and purple lines and the red one because there the lines are going to zero because melting has ceased and what glaciers remain will be preserved. The red line goes down to zero because at that point we will have lost all of the glaciers. In other words, business of, uh, as usual, other than very high altitudes and very high latitudes, we will lose the glaciers, uh, such as at, at, up at uh, Obisco right now, where Andreas is. Uh, most of the North American West, the tropical glaciers in the Andes are already lost. New Zealand, all around the world in the mid-latitudes, those will disappear. They will be very difficult to save. Permafrost loss, we're looking at 30 to 70 percent. And what's important about this is that once we reach about 4.5 degrees of warming, which we are still headed towards, uh, perhaps even by the end of this century, that will add 125 gigatons of carbon to the atmosphere. That's like adding another China or United States to our carbon budget, and our carbon budget is small enough already. Um, and then finally, on the great, great ice sheets, uh, West Antarctica, as Martin mentioned, may already have tipped. Um, and this is very interesting research that, again, does show that the Weiss, as it's called, is not as stable as thought. And it is extremely irreversible and seems to paleo-historically have gotten involved in sea level rise at about the temperatures where we are today. And this graph, which is obviously very busy, shows why. And what I would ask you to pay, pay attention to is that if you look at these lines, what they're showing from left to right is time moving forward at different levels of temperature. And the very top red and green lines as shown on the screen show uh, 
temperatures at about the temperatures we have today, not a whole lot higher. Um, and what the researchers tried to do in this case was to try and preserve the West Antarctic ice sheet at different temperatures. The problem was they could not keep it intact. Uh, the only thing that they could influence at the higher temperatures than what we have today was how long the West Antarctic ice sheet took to collapse completely. And at that ranges, as you'll see, from about 150 years on a very, very high warming scale. Uh, we can maybe delay it to 600 or eight to 900 years. But once that collapses, sea level rise can occur relatively quickly and the glaciers behind the ice sheet will then move into the ocean with nothing to stop them over a period of centuries to thousands of years. But the point is it is locked in at that point and that alone is six to nine meters of sea level rise. And finally, this is simply graphically showing what acidification could look like by 2100 on a business as usual scale. And as you can see, the colder waters, which are also some of the richest fisheries in the world, uh, in the northern and southern oceans will be extremely uh, saturated, eutrophied. Uh, it will impact the sea life there. And the scary thing about acidification is it is in some ways the least reversible of all of these dynamics because the, the buffering, in other words, to get us down to a pH where we are today can take 60 to 70,000 years. And if that time scale does not blow your mind, we have had a relatively stable pH in the world's oceans for 35 million years. So we are now playing with a chemistry that has not changed for 35 million years. All of the species virtually that we have today evolved at today's pH. We really don't know how they'll respond to the higher pHs to which we're headed, which again means we need to address CO2 very quickly. So to summarize, one really needs to look to the cryosphere when looking at mitigation pathways, not just peak temperature. What are called overshoot scenarios carry very high risk. Uh, one example, again, from Greenland, paleohistorically, Greenland is unstable at around 1.6 degrees, but that state of irreversible could be reached faster with higher temperatures. So again, the higher we go, the more risk we're taking on. The safest pathways stay below 1.5 degrees, and as Martin said, it's going to be difficult to do that right now without extremely urgent action. Uh, irreversible collapse of the wise is likely between where we are today and maybe 1.5 degrees, much higher though we need to stop. And the, the good news on one level is that there are available paths to, pre to prevent this new climate state, but in order to reach them, we really need deep sustained cuts right now. That's why this we don't have time is absolutely correct. Uh, one of the more promising pathways would combine action on air pollution with CO2 because cryosphere snow and ice reacts very, very strongly to air pollution, believe it or not. And so if we work on both of those at the same time, we'll get sustainable, develop, uh, sustainable development benefits as well. But the most important message I can give you is that the longer we delay, the greater the overshoot, the greater social and societal and environmental costs, and also the lower possible possibility we have for staying below 1.5 degrees or even getting there again. So thank you very much. And um, I, I hope I gave slight amount of hope there at the end. Very informative and, and very scary at the moment. And, uh, and a very good um, presentation of the situation. But I wonder when you, when you give this inf kind of information to policymakers and politicians, how do they re react? They usually say that they didn't realize that things were quite that difficult um, and quite that imminent. And the most difficult message that we have to give is that we're determining a future today that we will not see. And a lot of people say, well, no one's going to respond to anything in the future, and yet it's our responsibility. And I think we have to get past that idea of if we don't see it, it's not going to happen. It is going to happen. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pam. Yes, thanks. We will have the opportunity to talk more to you about Antarctica during during our panel session. Don't forget to use the hashtag. We don't have time to ask questions to our panel and keynote speakers. In order to have us read your questions, you need to have a Twitter account with your location set in your Twitter bio. Uh, later on, we can see all the tweets on this uh, screen here in the studio. Super cool. Now let's move from ice to water with our next speaker. Mm. 
All right. Peter Wardham is a professor of ocean and physics at the University of Cambridge. And uh, Peter, are you with us? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, very warm welcome. Um, is it also correct to say that you're one of, of the experts on, on the polar seas? Uh, yes, I've worked my whole life in, in, on the polar oceans, especially the Arctic Ocean. Uh, you've done some 40 or 50 expeditions there, is, isn't that so? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a couple of years over in the Arctic. Uh, in recent weeks, we said that there has been some reports about serious threats to the climate in Northern Europe. Uh, there's been talk about the Gulf Stream seems to slow down. And can, can you say something about that? Um, well, uh, I don't think it's true that Gulf Stream is slowing down, but there are changes going on in, in the circulation mm. of the Arctic Ocean uh, and the circulation of the Atlantic Ocean. And one of them is that the, the, uh, the, um, the Atlantic summer haline circulation, which is a very, very slow circulation driven by temperatures and salinities in, 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 in the ocean has slowed down. And the one of the reasons is that the, the, the place in the Arctic where a lot of the sinking of the water takes place to maintain a kind of a, uh, a global conveyor belt has stopped being able to operate because there's no longer any convection going on in that region. And the predictions from that are that um, by the end of the century, uh, there will be uh, less warming in the the fringe regions of Europe, Western Europe, uh, Ireland, um, Britain, Iceland, uh, and the, the Atlantic coasts of France. Um, that's because there's there will be less uh, heat being transported up to, towards Europe by the the currents coming from the tropical Atlantic. Um, one of those is the Gulf Stream, which is wind-driven, and that, that will keep going. But the Atlantic thermohaline circulation uh, is slowing down because of this lack of convection. And the result of that will be that um, we're, the predictions of a business-as-usual scenario are that, that most of Europe will ex experience about four degrees of warming by the end of the century, which is pretty disastrous. Uh, it will turn a lot of southern Europe into something resembling the Sahara. But uh, Western Europe will only experience about two degrees of warming, and uh, that will put, be quite nice for Britain and Ireland. However, that's ex experienced at the cost of much more warming in the tropical Atlantic, so that we can expect to see the uh, a, a, a slower warming in Europe balanced by far more rapid warming of the surface waters of the uh, of the Atlantic and the tropical Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico, which will be giving us more intense hurricanes. So you'd be getting very, very serious increase in the intensity of, of, of hurricanes in the, uh, in the southern states of the US, uh, while we'll be experiencing some more moderate warming in, in Western Europe. But that, that's just one of the effects of uh, and that, that effect comes from the fact that because of the lack of sea ice production in the Greenland Sea, we're not getting the amount of, uh, of dense water being produced that we used to get. Um, if I can go on and talk about um, sea ice, um, I would differ a little bit from the previous speaker and say that it's not at all easy to see how sea ice uh, loss can be reversed. It, it's not it's not as simple as has been uh, uh, made out. I think it, it's it's quite a it's going to be quite a difficult process to see how sea ice can be brought back, um, and the the consequences of sea ice retreat are, are quite serious right across the spectrum of what happens to the world. Um, the, firstly, the 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 retreat of uh, of ice or loss of ice from the Greenland ice sheet is partly due to the fact that uh, in warmer, a warmer summer climate in the Arctic with warmer uh, air because of lack of sea ice, there'll be greater amount of loss of, of water from, from the Greenland ice sheet surface, which will be giving us a, a, an accelerated sea level rise. So that's on top of the uh, the, the extra factors that, that um, 
the previous speaker described, which are the the, uh, the these extra horrors we can expect from the Antarctic ice sheet yeah. breaking up but to some extent. Instead, we're, we're going on top of that, we're going to have this steadily increasing rate of loss from the Greenland ice sheet. Yeah. So sea level rise will continue to accelerate and we don't see any way that is going to be easily reversed or slowed down. Uh, and then we will be also having losses um, in other ways from sea ice retreat. One of them is the possible threat of a uh, Russian Arctic, where the, at the moment there's a lot of methane in, in the sediments, in, in methane hydrates, which is held back from being released by the fact that there is a permafrost layer on the seabed which is busy melting at the moment because of the, again, the loss of summer sea ice. So what, do so you see, what, what kind of future do you see here? First, I need to ask you, when it comes to the Gulf Stream, are there any differences uh, depending on the season? Uh, I mean, you say it's, it's not going to get as warm as otherwise predicted if the Gulf Stream slows down a bit, but are there any differences during summertime versus wintertime, for instance? We've had a, quite a hard winter have, here in, in Scandinavia for the last two months, and then it pops up and it's almost summer temperature here. Uh, well, I think that's a different, that's a different mechanism. Um, that's really this uh, extreme weather yeah. event we mentioned before, uh, which is that the as the, the temperature difference between the Arctic and the tropics uh, gets reduced, the Arctic is really faster than the tropics, we find that the, the jet stream, which is the, the, the air mass se separating these two uh, atmospheric uh, types, the, the polar air mass and the, and the more tropical air mass, mm. that slows down. So that the jet stream is slowing down and it's slowing down moves into very thick lobes. And these large lobes give us slowly moving um, anomalies of warm and cold temperatures. They've right. been having these in the United States for 10 years, but we've had about the first one in Europe this year, which has been an extremely cold air mass yeah. in, in middle Europe and an extremely warm air mass in the Arctic itself. The Arctic Ocean has, warm, has, has been experiencing really anomalously warm air temperatures yeah. so that, that's that's an atmospheric effect i think that but the the uh, whereas the the change in the circulation of the atlantic is of course an oceanographic effect right 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 but we're we can see already at, at the warming a global warming of one degree we are affecting global weather patterns around the world and it's uh, and we're heading into the future with a further warning up top on that thank you very much for that uh, for that introduction or thank you for now wow it's it's uh, it's a bit depressing some of these you think so <laughs> this is reality this is I the know, first one we were supposed to if you wait a little bit it's gonna we're gonna fix we're gonna hopefully no I'm, I'm not gonna say we're gonna fix it but we will move into first we have this session of, of reality and it it's rather dark and a lot of problems yes um we we can see later on we'll see what we can do about this yes. uh, actually uh, let's not lose hope so to speak in our upcoming sessions we are going to talk about solutions and actions mm. that's true and it's uh, now it's time for our first panel session just a quick reminder use the hashtag we don't have time for questions and comments that we can read live during the broadcast. With us uh, in the panel, we have Pam Pearson, Dennis L. Meadows, Andreas Bergström. I don't know if he's with us now. He's with us now. That's right. great. That's great. Back from the glacier. Uh, Ritraj, Pukan, Stuart, Scott and Peter Wadhams. Very welcome. All of them are there. Yeah, that's great. The, the wonders of technique. The technique is functioning. Andreas, are you with us? Yes, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Now yeah, now we, we can hear, hear you. you. Welcome. <laughs> you were out Thank on the you. glaciers before. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Not signal. So let's start this panel session. I'm heading uh, a question to you, Pam. If the situation is as severe as uh, some of you have pointed out, and basic energy flows are altered by human activities and human life, what can we as individuals really do about it? <laughs> You know, I would say that the most important thing we as individuals can do is convince our political leadership that we care about this and that they need to do something about it. Because 
I work a lot with negotiators and uh, a lot of people sometimes get angry at them for not doing enough, but the problem is not at the negotiator level, the problem is at the political level. And we really need to work on that. And I would say that it's, it's indicating to the political leadership that we're willing to do what is required. The most important thing of course is that we need to stop emitting CO2 as soon as possible. And we need to stop building in infrastructure that locks us into using both coal, natural gas, oil over the coming decades, because we really don't have time to keep on using those sources of energy. We need to do a transition very quickly. Yeah. And Professor Meadows, you and your co-author, you wrote um, about these things, um, about, about the acceleration and all the tipping points potentially there already in the in the 1970s and you actually wrote a follow-up to this book uh, this limits book. to growth in 19 2004 i think it was and what what is the what has what it has been the reaction uh, to your predictions uh, when you talk about these in, in to the public and policymakers those uh, trends that we pointed out in 1972 have only accelerated so I haven't seen much concrete uh, response. Uh, my own response has been to move away from a preoccupation with uh, the limits to starting to uh, design new ways of making our society more resilient. Mm. I mean, uh, the previous speakers have made clear that we're coming into a very difficult time and we need to uh, have an agriculture, uh, an energy system, even a political system that can uh, come through that time with most of our basic uh, civic values still intact. Yeah. Can you give the listeners um, a brief explanation of what, what do you mean by resilient then? Because if we're moving into uh, unknown territory with uh, potential large changes, what, what does actually resilient mean then? Resilience is the property of a system to attain its goals even when it is unexpectedly shocked. Mm. Uh, a brittle system, if you shock it, it just uh, collapses and no longer functions. Uh, so we need, obviously, to create systems that are resilient, that uh, yeah. give us our basic social values, despite drastic changes in climate and um, so forth. Yes, I would like to direct a question to you, Andreas, since we didn't have <laughs> time to talk with you earlier, we weren't able to do that. Uh, can you just tell us a little about your work on the glaciers at Tarfala? Yeah, yeah sure. We are uh, working on, actually, as, as we speak, we're working on a few glaciers. And what we're doing is we're uh, measuring the what we call the mass balance. Uh, to see if they are increasing or decreasing in size uh, when it comes to, to climate change. And how, how does it look? Yeah, well, they are uh, retreating, as most glaciers in the world, uh, they're retreating uh, pretty fast. Uh, glaciers are in, uh, good indicators of what's happening to the climate, to precipitation and to uh, temperature uh, so these ones are retreating and uh, losing mass quickly. Uh, there's one uh, glacier in particular where we're on, um, which is on average around 100 meters thick. And uh, it's losing uh, about vertically, it's losing about one meter uh, of ice each year, uh, which means that in about 100 years or so, uh, there will be uh, not so much glacier left. And, and that's, of course, uh, that's a short uh, period of time. Um, it's, we're, we're talking even the, the next uh, generation will, might experience uh, not seeing glaciers up here in the valley. I have a question on that. We're going to take a Twitter question, but I have a, a follow up on that. When, yes. you say, when you say it's losing a meter, um, is it correct to actually to have a linear extrapolation of the changes? Don't we reach tipping points? And maybe this is an open question. Maybe it's to to uh, to Dennis or um, or Pam or or Peter. What can we actually expect? Is the linear explanation really valid? Yeah, if I can if I can yeah. start answering that, it's really hard to say because uh, I mean, increasing temperatures, which we are experiencing, uh, might also lead to increasing precipitation, more snow on the glacier, which means that they might start to 
uh, to increase again in in uh, in size and volume. Uh, but so it's really hard to tell. But I, I mean, uh, we we don't have time to speculate in a way. We we have to <laughs> look look back to see what happens, uh, what has happened, and and uh, do models from that and try to figure out as as well as we can. Uh, what's going on with these glaciers? And of course, if these glaciers are disappearing, it doesn't it doesn't really matter for ecosystem or or people here. But as we've heard before, uh, we we've, we've done studies on uh, uh, the the biggest glaciers on the planet, the East Antarctic Ice Sheet and the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. And the, if those mm. are starting to react, then we have big problem. And and uh, we're we're gambling a lot if we don't do anything about it. Yeah. Well spoken. I heard in my ear that we have a Twitter question. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah. Can you help me out, Martin? Go ahead. Uh, we have a question um, uh, regarding the methane uh, clarate feedback just mentioned. And uh, we need to talk about a little bit about, about these, the methane that is buried in the permafrost. And uh, uh, I we think have it's both directed them. to Peter. Yeah. Peter Wadhams. Yes, well, the... the um Evidence is fieldwork was done every year, but every year there's a very increased amount of methane coming out of the shallow waters of the Arctic shelves out into the atmosphere, which is is actually a a, a cause of the the recent change in methane concentration mm. towards an increase, and uh, this seems to be uh, a product of the fact that that the until until you had some open water in the Arctic in the summer, which you never used to have, um, the, 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 the water near the near the the, water, the surface waters and and the, you didn't have any melt going on, so you had these um, permafrost which was holding back a very large amount, of water, uh, and that permafrost was melting. So that methane is now coming out in very large plumes into the, into the atmosphere, and that's the, the fact. The fear that it could become a, a a much more serious effect is is underlies uh, one of one of our fears about Arctic feedbacks that that mm. might get out of control. And that is methane that is already there. It's not methane from biological uh, decomposition on land. Because we have no, there's an entirely separate process. This is methane that's already there, right? But on land, you're having methane that's being produced as the permafrost slowly melts. Mm. So there's going to be a long-term methane release going on uh, from from this huge area of, of uh, permafrost on land, right. which in the end will release as much methane as the offshore. But the offshore methane gets released more quickly and suddenly, which means it has a bigger effect over a short. Thank you. Pam, you wanted to comment that or? Yes, I did, because I think this is a misunderstanding that a lot of people have. In other words, one has permafrost, which is on land. Uh, and that is what has been studied a great deal right now. But one also has what you can think of as flooded permafrost when sea levels went up as, as the last ice age ended. And those are just offshore. And those are the methane hydrates or clathrates that Dr. Wadhams is talking about right now. And we understand those much less, but the potential emissions from those are huge. So one has, you can say, on land permafrost and then flooded permafrost in a sense that is just offshore that could have a huge amount of carbon that is not taken into account right now by climate modeling. Do you mind if I pick one more question from our sure. viewers? Yes. Uh, Jeppe D. Larsen writes to the panel, if you already mentioned it, I might have missed it when the kids were playing around in the background. <laughs> but as a sailor, I wonder if the severe storms will get more common and worse in the world, and especially around Scandinavia. If yes, how soon and how bad? He is concerned. He's I would concerned. do if I, if I was a sailor. Well, I am. Anyway. <laughs> so any, anyone who wants to answer this? Um, anyone raising their hands about the about the storms? There are more more energy in the in the in the weather system as the temperature goes up, and the hydrological cycle is intensified. So there's definitely more energy there, but we will see more storms. Or are they only focused onto the onto onto the the really hur big hurricanes, for instance? I think it's uh, pretty clear that there will be more storms uh, as we add more energy 
to the climate system, yeah. uh, get more mixing of hot and cold more rapidly. And um, it's been uh, compared to turning up the flame under a pot of water and seeing the turbulence in the pot. That's what we're getting now. So unfortunately, um, um, the occupation of being a mariner will probably get more hazardous um, to the the the, pers the Twitter's uh, question. Yes. yes. Thank you so that much, Stuart. We will listen to more speakers and then hear from all of you again for the second panel session. Thank you so much. All right. So um, uh, we're, we're going, going to, to run it off. Right? Yeah, we're going to run <laughs> it off this session. And, and uh, thanks for all, all of you for this great discussion that we have. And um, who's our next guest? Let's see. Rit Rit Rai. Rai. Sorry, I got lost and you got lost. Yeah, together. <laughs> yes, I'm trying to find my information here. I'm sorry about this. Ritaraj Pukan is Chief Operating Officer at Walk for Water. Welcome. <coughs> and you know, Ritaraj, the stage is yours, okay. so please go ahead. Namaste. I have a short presentation about the severity of uh, India's water crisis. You're sharing your screen. Thank you so much. Yeah, I hope you can see that. Yes, we can. Uh, so, on the, so on the blue planet, we have a water crisis and water has emerged as a local issue of global climate change. Uh, more than uh, half a billion people are affected in India alone. And uh, India is among the countries actually fast depleting the underground water sources. Uh, the situation really is going from bad to worse. These, some of these figures are really astonishing. Water tables are falling 20 feet per year in uh, Gujarat and 95% of wells have uh, dried up in the state of Tamil Nadu. This year during the color festival of uh, Holi, uh, the local authorities restricted the use of water in Gujarat. Uh, wetlands have shrunk, disappeared, and rivers have run dry. Uh, uh, just last week, a new satellite the early warning system talked about shrinking reservoirs. More than half of our uh, population is uh, now water stressed. So farmers uh, are feeling the you know the brunt of uh, the water crisis, and it has manifested in thousands of them committing suicide, which is really really sad. And it is not just water scarcity. Uh, changes in precipitation patterns has devastated agriculture all over the country. Uh, for the North Indian states depending on the Himalayan rivers, uh, in the short term, we face the, uh, you know, the threat of floods and in the long term, uh, seasonal water scarcity. Uh, these are the Indian water towers. So uh, about 40% of the global uh, human population depend on this. So it's really very real for people. We are having uh, floods in the most unlikeliest of places. Now, this is an iconic image that, uh, that many people in India will remember from June 2013. 847% extra rainfall. We are not equipped to deal with such climate emergencies. Uh, this is uh, my home Assam, where we have a water problem of a different kind. We have uh, floods which have increased in intensity and frequency in the last few years. Uh, the main city, Guwahati, uh, ha has flooded streets, but at the same time, there is a scarcity of drinking water. Heat waves have increased, uh, leading to further stress, uh, demand for more water. Uh, Bangalore, like Cape Town and Delhi, are also facing day zero, according to some reports. Now, uh, man-animal conflict uh, has uh, uh, increased because uh, everybody needs to go water. Uh, food and water crisis has uh, actually uh, forced animals to move out of protected areas and uh, made them more vulnerable to poaching uh, as well as road kills. But I have great hope. And one of the reasons is uh, my friend here, uh, the forest man of India, Mr. Jadapayang, says that reforestation is the key and the 
Indian government has taken up uh, forest uh, patient on a uh, on a mass scale in record numbers. Uh, I think we have already exceeded the commitments made under the Paris Agreement. At Walk for Water, we set up this community water centers at some of the uh, most uh, drought prone areas uh, using all available water and supplying them to the water stressed people at very affordable rates. Um, I find these water ATMs uh, could actually solve, help solve the problem of plastic uh, bottles that are littering and clogging up uh, all our water bodies and rivers. The greatest hope that I have is of course rainwater harvesting because the potential uh, in India is massive and we have uh, hardly utilized uh, a, a, a small fraction of the uh, potential that we actually have. India is also a huge water uh, wasting country. And uh, at Walk for Water, we have made it our mission uh, to increase water awareness. We have this water pledge that uh, has gone all over the country to millions of celebrities that endorse it. And with the help of climate reality leaders, it has uh, been administered in over a hundred countries and on, uh, on all the seven continents. Uh, we work with students uh, and around campuses, we always ask uh, them the question, if they would uh, make informed choices, if they would act on climate change, then the answer is always a, a resounding yes. Uh, it is our problem. Everybody recognizes that and uh, the greatest threat uh, to the planet is the belief that someone else will solve it. That's uh, Robert Swan. I believe in that because we really don't have time. Thank you very much and must be. Thank you very much. What, Thank you. What, what, is the, what is the message that you send to the world leaders or the local leaders that you have around you when you see these changes and, and the way you adapt and, and, and what information you can give them? Uh, well, the people have spoken. Uh, we have seen the evidence. Uh, now, really, it, this is the time to take decisive action. We cannot uh, wait for uh, the future generations to uh, start blaming, you know, the past uh, or blaming the current uh, generation for not taking action. Uh, we really need to act. That's the message. Yeah. That's a great message. Thank you, Thank you very you much. Thank you so much, Rich, uh, Ritraj Pukan. You will stay on for our panel session. So please. To our viewers, do not hesitate to ask questions to Mr. Pukan using the hashtag we don't have time. And now on to our next speaker. Dennis Meadows, we've heard you on one panel already, so just a short introduction. You are an emeritus professor of systems management and widely known for the book The Limits to Growth, which came out in 1972 and is concerned with exponential growth in a world with finite resources. Please, Professor, go ahead. Dennis is sharing professor his screen. He's about to professor. share okay. his screen. Welcome. So in uh, 1972, when we published our uh, first book, we gave a curve of uh, CO2 emissions. And uh, they were at that time about 320 parts per million. Uh, more recently, they have grown up to 410. And the interesting question is, why is that? Uh, Martin basically asked what happened. From, are you seeing my slides? Um, no, actually, no, I think, but no. I think we... This might be a technical... Our... Just a moment here. So please press play, Professor. If you, if you press play uh, uh, on, your screen, on your screen, go a little uh, bit left. I'm seeing his slides, so... Share so, screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And if you, if you press play, I think we will be able to... N now oh, we can we, see, we now see, we can see, we your, can see them. your slides. <laughs> it was, the problem was here. So the question really comes then, why, uh, why is this uh, going on? And looking back on the last uh, 45 years, I'm going to offer just a couple of very simple ideas. Uh, there, the, the efforts to control uh, CO2 emissions have been based on a very common idea about climate control that um, 
uh, CO2 emissions go up, and that uh, has an influence on the biosphere health. And by biosphere health, we're talking about things which have been already discussed. Uh, uh, the health of the glaciers, sea level rise, uh, 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 groundwater uh, and precipitation, storms and so forth. And as the biosphere health uh, start to deteriorate, then the, the common idea is that we all get together in things like the Kyoto Accord, uh, develop some policies, and that will uh, reduce the CO2. It's, if you permit a very simple analogy, it's kind of like a bathtub uh, where so, uh, where uh, CO2 emissions come in and uh, uh, the level of the uh, biosphere goes down and then there's policies to reduce it. It's a very simplistic idea. Unfortunately, it doesn't work because it's based on a uh, on some bad policies. It assumes that we can reduce the CO2 after we see decline in biosphere health, despite the kinds of irreversibilities that Pam was talking about. And it suggests that our goal really should just be to try to make the emissions a bit lower. Uh, you know, this, this approach uh, assumes, A, that uh, we will quickly see what's happening to the biosphere. Everyone will agree on the damage, uh, that they'll all, uh, be able quickly after they agree to develop control policies, which will actually reduce the CO2 emissions. And then after they bring them back down, the biosphere health uh, improves quickly again. Well, some of the former speakers have shown uh, that that doesn't work very well. And in fact, all of these assumptions are false. They ignore uh, four really important delays. Uh, there's a long delay between CO2 emissions and concentration between concentration and health, between health and political consensus. And then even after the political consensus begins to emerge, it takes a while to bring the CO2 emissions uh, back down. You know, Pam was talking you know, about uh, even centuries of change in these delays. So let's look what is really going on. CO2 emissions, uh, again, using a bathtub analogy, uh, are balanced to some extent by the rate at which CO2 is absorbed by the ocean, by uh, biomass and so forth. And that leads to a level of CO2 concentration, which of course doesn't actually give us heat. It reduces the amount of heat that radiates uh, back out. Uh, the heat we get is coming in from the sun and leads to us what we might call uh, basically a heat in the atmosphere. Well, what happens is as the CO2 emissions go up, uh, then the CO2 concentration starts to go up. And if you look down at heat radiation, you'll see it reduces the heat radiation. And so therefore, just like a bathtub, if you reduce the amount of water going out and don't change the incoming water, then the level starts to go back up. And what that does in this case is starts to cause uh, a lot of ecological disruption. Uh, a lot of indicators here, uh, we've mentioned some of them, uh, sea level rise, uh, uh, more dramatic storms, uh, species loss, uh, loss of glaciers, and so forth. And what's going to happen eventually is as that biosphere health, uh, it, it becomes apparent, the, there will be consensus, but it takes an extremely long time, as, as unfortunately shown by, by the current uh, policies of the United States vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Kyoto climate accord. When the consensus emerges, there will be policies. Uh, and if we're smart uh, and consistent and long-sighted, uh, eventually those policies will reduce uh, the CO2 emissions. Uh, but just think about the difference between having one bathtub that you're trying to control the level and having a gang of three bathtubs in a row. Imagine that you're trying to control biosphere health in this image by changing the faucet up at CO2 emissions, and that the delays between those are, in some cases, decades or centuries. Uh, this doesn't uh, make a system that's very easy to control. Because uh, when you see the biosphere damage, it's already too late uh, to av avoid really, really serious problems. Uh, that means we need to uh, um, reduce those emissions before we start to observe the damage. 
And the goal isn't simply to take them down. It really needs to be that we bring CO2 back down to the level that can be absorbed uh, by the various mechanisms of the biosphere. I mean, using, again, a simple bathtub analogy, obviously, if you have a small hole in your tub going out, you can't be uh, running a lot of water into the tub uh, indefinitely unless uh, you want to have uh, serious overflow. And it just brings us back to this uh, proverb, which I found from uh, the former prime minister of Japan. If you don't understand the problem, it's impossible to solve it. So far, uh, our politicians at least haven't understood it, and they haven't solved it. And we don't have much time. Well, that's, Thank you. That's great. That was a great presentation. So concluded a little bit. There, there's uh, the delay time is, uh, I mean, you made a great conclusion. Great. I, I, I don't dare to do it, but the feedback loops is what you talk about. And there's a, the lack of all the negative balancing feedbacks in society, but there's a lot of positive feedback loops in, in nature that could increase the changes in itself. But as, as I understand you, especially the lack of um, feedback loops promptly in the societies to react on what we will see in the future and lack of trust, I suppose, as well. Yeah, it's actually not a loss of feedback loops. There are unfortunately lots and lots of feedback loops, uh, but they are uh, structured to achieve different goals. They're yeah. structured to achieve uh, high profits by the fossil fuel companies or uh, power by uh, politicians who don't want to frustrate their con uh, voters by telling them about problems they don't know how to solve. And so those short-term uh, self-interested uh, feedback loops are dominating now. That's uh, the real problem we have. The positive feedback loops are obviously apparent. When we study the historical record of climate change over and over again, for example, in the ice cores, you see the tendency of the climate to flip rather quickly. You know, if uh, temperature is going to increase uh, three or four degrees over a century, it doesn't do that uh, a tenth of a degree at a time. Uh, it'll go along, and then suddenly, over a period of a decade, there'll be uh, a significant jump. Yeah. So there, those feedback loops are very important to us. Should we focus on something else than the feedback loop, some, some other of the leverage points in the systems to, under, to make the policymakers and, and decision holders to understand the system? Well, I'm... It's what I call the magic button question. You know, if you had a magic button that you could push to solve these problems, what would it be? Uh, I think one important button is time horizon. We need in, uh, in a variety of ways to get people to start thinking about the consequences of today's actions 10 or 100 years into the future. Parents do that. They do worry about their kids, but politicians don't seem to have the same uh, ethic. Mm. All right. I Thank agree. you, Dr. Meadows. That was uh, very interesting. Thank you. And you will be joining us again in the panel session in a few minutes away. Uh, but before that, we have one fi final keynote in this segment uh, that we call Reality. And it is Stuart Scott. So. Stuart Scott was the first environmentalist stockbroker on Wall Street, and he's also the founder of Transition University. He's also the founder of ex and executive director of United Planet Faith and Science Initiative. Welcome. Welcome. Again, we need to say. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Scott. If I may uh, share my screen here. Please do. I, I have a presentation. And let's play. Um, to correct you slightly on your map, uh, I, I have a, a different picture of the globe, and the big red pointer is the east coast of the United States, but I'm actually located in, in Honolulu. My, I call my property a tiny little farm, uh, Honolulu Farms, and there it is. All right. So I'm 12 hours out of sync with you in, in Sweden, and it's uh, <laughs> 4 a.m. where I am. Um, but let's switch back to a, a more traditional view of the... Uh, uh, the Earth. This is the one that was a uh, gift to humanity from NASA, and I use that as our uh, as a touchstone during my presentation. That's my organization and the uh, logo under which I uh, do all of my my climate and ecological work. And I like to give my email address so people can contact me. And yes, we don't have time, and because of that, let me get right down to the the Arctic methane release, which is also 
uh, been covered previously by uh, Peter Wadhams, uh, my friend Peter, and and others. It's the gun going off in the Arctic, as far as I'm concerned, and not a gun in the sense of a race starting, but gun in the sense of the gun that's pointed, we are pointing at ourselves. Um, here's a, a set of polar projections, polar maps. On the left, uh, the state of methane detected over the Arctic in November of 2008, and on the right, November of 2012. You can see a huge difference. This is the Arctic releasing its methane, um, and this is the Arctic Ocean, uh, more over the ocean than, than over land masses. Uh, and let me refer to uh, one of the three researchers, Dr. Ira Leifert, who you can see here. He's an atmospheric scientist uh, with UC Santa Barbara. And in particular, I like to, uh, I don't like, but I often do quote uh, a quote that he made in 2013. In three parts, I'll give it to you. Some scientists are indicating we should make plans to adapt to a four degree hotter world. That's four centigrade, almost double that in Fahrenheit. In the United States, we measure in Fahrenheit. While prudent, one wonders what portion of the population could adapt to such a world. My view is that it's just a few thousand people seeking refuge in the Arctic or Antarctica. Now, this is one man's opinion but a well-informed man uh, at that. So this is a very dire future we're looking at if we don't get it and get it quickly. We don't have time. Now, I want to show four additional maps. This one uh, is the first of a series of four that shows the drought conditions uh, experienced in the uh, first decade of this century. And the next three will show the one-third point, two-third point, and the final decade of the century. Take a look at the scale, uh, dark blueing, much wetter than usual, and uh, red to purple and pink, um, meaning much drier than usual. And the source is the University Corporation of Atmospheric Research, a consortium of universities in the United States, well respected. So take a look at the changes. Uh, now notice also that in the Sahara region, you have yellow and green. That doesn't mean they're wet. It means it was normally dry. Again, this is a relative uh, uh, drought map. Take a look at 2030 through 39 and the drought patterns that are developing. 2060 through 69 and 2090 through 99. So my principal fear is not ocean rise. My principal fear is the ability for humanity to feed itself because a huge swath of the United States, North America, of the Mediterranean, of Southern Africa, of the Amazon, will be very difficult to conduct agriculture. And the places that are still receiving rain are Northern Canada and Northern Russia, and those traditionally are not agricultural and don't have uh, thick uh, uh, topsoil as we do in the mid-latitudes. But going back to 2030 to 39, there's enough damage being done there that we have a serious concern for those alive now. And this is one of the problems is that if we keep saying that this is a problem of 2100, 2200, 1000 years, we're not going to get it. Humanity reacts when it's threatened now, and we are threatened now. We are threatening ourselves now. Again, back to the touchstone, our only home. I want to try to bring us to a realization. I want to go bigger than carbon dioxide as the cause of what's happening. What really is causing this? I like to say that, again, I don't like, but I often say that global civilization has an operating system. Few people talk about an operating system for, for civilization, but we do have one and it's seriously flawed. It's dysfunctional, in fact, and it is self-destructive as it's turning out. So what would you call that operating system? Money and economics. But in particular, it's a brand of economics, neoclassical economics, also known as growth economics, also known as mainstream econ economics, because it has supplanted all other economic theories for the past hundred years till it's the only game in town. It dictates what happens when, where, what doesn't happen, who gets elected. Money and economics are in control of humanity. Now, our economic operating system is converting nature into money as quickly as it possibly can. It's turning this into this. Or another way of looking at it, 
it's turning this, a lush, rich nature, into this. We know it. We get it. That part we get. Well, many of us get. Those who stand to benefit most by the system are perhaps intentionally not getting it. The operating system itself prevents us from confronting or even seeing the problem. Again, this sits above carbon dioxide as, as where the problem is coming from, in my opinion. In nearly every university on earth, mainstream economics teaches that nature is an externality. Incredible that we don't care about nature in our economic system is unfathomable to me. Globally, money is held to be the highest measure of value. Just take a look at the language, net worth, price, earnings, the bottom line, interest, GDP, all measures of value of the individual, of the corporation, of the, of the country, and of course, bottom line, which is a metaphor for the most important thing, even though it refers to a monetary uh, summation of, of, of what it's worth. Arguably, money is the only measure of value in society, and that is the source of our problem. In America, it's just referred to as the almighty dollar. We cut to the chase. Unless we can make a paradigm shift to an economic system that values and assesses ecology and ethical behavior, we ourselves may become a casualty of anthropogenic extinction. So. I'm going to go to a solution, even though I'm in the first part of describing the first section of describing the problem. And this is a proposal. In order to shift the paradigm, I say let's employ civilization's most respected recognition, the Nobel Peace Prize. Let's change this, change money using this. In particular, I've got a proposal out for a Nobel Peace Prize for sustainable development but I will say truly sustainable development since the neoclassical economists have tried to co-opt the term sustainable development into sustainable growth, which it is not. That's an oxymoron. The URL for this proposal is np4sd.org, Nobel Prize for Sustainable Development.org. And there are three nominees. One is the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome sponsored the Limits to Growth study, which the former speaker, Dennis Meadows, was one of the, the principal authors of. His wife, Donella Meadows, Jorgen Randers, and William Behrens were all participants in that first study in 1972. And it was updated 30 years later. And it is we are still tracking the predictions made in that original model, very robust model. The second nominee, Dr. Herman Daly, Dr. Daly was a World Bank senior economist for eight years until he resigned because the World Bank of that day was not getting it. He's known as the father of ecological economics, which is a viable alternative to the current growth economics, which only focuses on, on money, externalizes ethics and ecology. And a quote from Dr. Daly, there is something fundamentally wrong with treating the earth as if it were a business in liquidation. And the third nominee, Pope Francis, perhaps strange bedfellows, you might say, but not so. Pope Francis caused to be published in 2015 an encyclical, which became world famous, called Praised Be or Laudato Si in the original language of St. Francis, his namesake. And let me give you just one quote from this document. Given the insatiable and irresponsible growth produced over many decades, we need also to think of containing growth by setting some reasonable limits and even retracing our steps before it's too late. This document is very important. And Pope Francis started to use green habit for the clergy, and I call him the green pope. He's not the first clergyman to sound the alarm, but he has sounded it at great risk personally, I believe. And so I believe he's, he is deserving of a shared Nobel Peace Prize for sustainable development. Thank you very much. That's what I have. And here again is my email address for anybody who would like to get in touch with me afterwards. 
you thank very you. much. Yes, thank you, Mr. Scott. I know you have some uh, some questions. Yeah, we, need, we almost need, need to repeat that again, all the, the your keynote presentation. That was um, very great, I think. And what do you think it takes for people to understand, to really get this? Uh, a scientist once told me it, it takes a double whammy to understand. You need to have like two big catastrophes which are not linked together to really get it on a personal level. But uh, what, what does it take? I, I would say it takes a shock. It, it takes one or more. It takes repeated shocks. I'm not into sugarcoating this. I used to present to young audiences. I no longer do because I think it's a disservice. Now, I have personally created some problems in my own family. I have two sons who are now in their 20s who grew up with this, and they certainly understand it. Um, but I think for um, mature individuals, teenagers on upward, we need to get them very aware of the future they face, because I believe our hope is with the youth of the planet taking to the streets, has been demonstrated recently with another issue of uh, uh, gun control in the United States and the shootings, the epidemic of shootings in mm -hmm. Parkland. Mm -hmm. yeah. thank, thank you so much, Mr. Scott. Thank you. To thank our you. viewers, I would like to say, don't forget to use the hashtag. We don't have time to ask questions to our speakers and to our panelists. We have now reached, uh, reached the last panel session in this segment, a segment that we call reality. We will meet Pam Pearson, Dennis Meadows, Andreas Bergström, Ritteraj, Pukan, Stuart Scott and Peter Wadhams. You are all with us? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's great. We promised to ring the alarm bell loud yep. and clear and I think uh, this really challenges how many people uh, view the world that we live in. Um, and some say maybe finally somebody rings the alarm bell loud and clear. Uh, Stuart, how can we tackle that we may be in for a steep and slippery slope without losing hope? Without losing hope. Um, I asked that question of, uh, uh, of, of Herman Daly some time ago, how is it you maintain hope? And his response was, it's our ethical responsibility to maintain hope, even in the face of some dire consequences. And to me, hope is equivalent to action. I have a depressive cycle where I get down and I come back up when I start to work on the problem again. So mm -hmm. action and hope are interchangeable concepts. We're going to talk about mm -hmm. action later on. Do we have any reflections from the other panelists on, on Stuart Scott's presentation? Yeah, that would be interesting to hear. I think it's useful to remember that we are making some mistakes as we think about these things. Uh, we will learn more. and. Uh, Although some of those surprises will be negative, I hope some of them will be positive. If you despair and do nothing, uh, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Certainly nothing good will happen. But if you, as Herman Daly said, maintain hope and stay in the fight, uh, then the chances are that something uh, useful can come from your results. Mm. I have a question for you, Andreas. Uh, how can the scientific community become more vocal and better at uh, communicate, communicating at it, its findings uh, regarding climate change? Andreas? Andreas, you do you hear us? Maybe we lost Andreas. Uh, sorry, uh, I was on mute. Can you hear okay. me now? Oh, no, we can. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to repeat the question? Oh, he probably heard you. Uh, no, oh, no you I heard, heard you. So what's uh, your thought on that? Yeah, I, th I think historically that uh, researchers have been uh, pretty bad at, at uh, uh, they wanted to stay neutral in a way and pretty bad at, at spreading the, the message. But I think nowadays with social media and maybe nowadays uh, actually easier to getting funding if you are if you're good at outreach, uh, I think, I think uh, researchers are getting um, a lot better at to doing that. I'm not a researcher myself, but uh, the ones I work with have, have um, been really improving on that. So I'm, I'm really happy about the situation. Mm. Using social media. I, 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 now, now we have uh, another question from our viewers via Twitter. This, I think, is directed to you, Pam. Going back to Pam's point about making our voices known to policymakers about climate change, how best does she suggest we do this? So please, Pam. 
Um, I would think that the best way to do it is to um, simply raise the issues at every single possibility. Um, send letters mm -hmm. and climate marches that have happened in the United States in particular, because the U.S. is, is very stuck in many ways. But a lot of the other larger countries, I, I think that uh, one of the uh, things raised by several speakers in terms of parents are worried about their children uh, and grandchildren to be able to focus on, on that as well and to um, put those needs ahead. But I'd also uh, second what Scott had to say, Stuart had to say in terms of really moving uh, youth because they're the ones that are uh, having this, this planet, you know, after us and their children. The other thing I'd say also in terms of scientists is that um, I've been doing this now outside of the diplomatic uh, corps for about 10 years right now, and I've seen a huge change in the willingness of scientists to step forward. It was one of the reasons that um, I started ICCI, and the degree of alarm among cryosphere scientists especially has gotten so great that they are becoming increasingly willing to step out of that role because they can see what's coming and they don't see sufficient action. So that, I think, is, is a cause for hope. You, and if I can step in for a yeah. moment, uh, for me, one of the, the principal causes for hope that I see is that um, the youth um, are uh, uh, speaking up in terms of litigation. We have young people who are, are um, champions uh, who are going to the courts and suing various political entities. The United States is being sued. Uh, governor uh, uh, of Florida, who is a climate denier, is being sued. In many places around the world, the youth are saying, we won't stand for this, and they're going to the courts. To me, that is the hope of the future. Mm -hmm. can, can we really use the old system to change the yeah, system and, itself? And I, or, yeah? I, I was wondering, can, can we use the old system to transform the system in itself, or do we need any sorts of new institutions between uh, the science and policymakers, or 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 wherever? I would say all of the above. But, uh -huh. <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> new, new institutions, but we need a new way of thinking because it's not enough to simply say let's do better at reducing uh -huh. carbon emissions. Because however fast we reduce them, that, that we're not going to get them down rapidly enough to be able to save ourselves from very severe climate change. So that means thinking in a new way, which means thinking about the necessity of actually removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere mm. in some way, that, that you have to think in those ways. You can't think anymore about just uh, being less uh, less messy with the planet. It's, it's absolutely a new way of thinking is necessary if we're going to save the place. Yeah. Thank you. We have time for one more question from our viewer Gustav Stenbeck. Uh, a question for the panel and to Stuart Scott. What are your thoughts on access economy that still works on the same new economic paradigm but potentially without the consumerism? Stuart. Well, we're not going to, more than likely, not going to shift to a completely new economics anytime soon. There's too much momentum. There are too many uh, stakeholders who have a large stake in keeping it the same way. Um, yes, uh, a reducing the consumerist ethic is, is very important. In one of the presentations I give, I go through a, a listing uh, various isms uh, of society. You've got uh, Buddhism and you've got Jainism and you've got Judaism and um, Christianity is different, but you've got um, a whole lot of isms, including consumerism. And I call consumerism the pseudo religion of the planet. Um, we worship in temples and we worship at malls. We go to the temples on Sunday or Saturday, but we go to the malls every time we need that inspiration that we have been sold, um, we will get by shopping. So if we can change that, it will be a large step in a very positive direction. One of the critical factors is that we have to stop, we have to disambiguate between what we 
want and what we need. We are being sold things that we want. Our wants are, are being exacerbated. What we need is a much lighter footprint on the planet. And how do we achieve that? I mean, the, in the transition from the unsustainable system that we have right now, uh, we want to transform to something else. But I think we need to focus on what, not only what from, but what to as well. But you're touching on it yes. right there. It's a, it's a spiritual thing. I call my organization, the United Planet Faith and Science Initiative. It's the faith part. It's the part that we need to start finding our, our fulfillment inside Okay, not exterior as we are being sold. We're very prone to being uh, advertised to and at, and so this is something that individuals have to have to learn themselves. This is something one can do. I mean, everybody can think about how we consume. It's easy. Thank you so much for a great discussion. It's been a pleasure to have all of you with us. Uh, thank you, Pam, Pam Pearson, Andreas Bergström, Professor Dennis Meadows, Rita Raj, Pukan, Stuart Scott, and Professor Peter Wadhams. Thanks again. Mm. Now, now, Julia, the end of our segment, reality is very close. Yeah, and I was like, it, it feels like it's not only the end of the segment, it almost feels like it's the end of the world. There's so much to talk about. Yeah. What, what are you, what, what are you thoughts after this first segment? Um, I think we got a, and now we only sp spoke to a couple of all the knowledge uh, that we have, but those, these fellows that we have had on, on this panel uh, represent one of the most uh, parts of the of sort of the best knowledge we have on this planet on the situation that we're in and what we need to do and how to address it. And, it's um, yeah, it is really, really alarming, and and we've mostly touched upon how the situation is in nature, not how so much about how humanity will respond on these things. I tend to I think about that when I see climate maps, uh, 30 or 60 or 100 years into the future, and you yeah, see droughts, etc. We're not going to jump into the, those situations. We're gonna. It's a continuous time is continuing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, the way that people will react to things that happen, that really scares me. And I mean, this session was a bit scary, but we haven't even touched on how people will, might react upon the stress that we will feel what do you from think climate, will climate change. I don't, want to, we, we, I don't think we have time. <laughs> we to don't go have there. time. But so I would like to, to continue asking, uh, talking about it, of course. So right. people should stick around, right? Because yep. we have another segment. It's called Solutions. Right. It's We're moving into there. Uh, so it's time for a short break. We will be back in approximately 12 minutes at 1645 CET. And Join us for the next segment, Solutions for the Climate Crisis. Thank you for now.